We're excited to be here. So Shelly and I will do just quick bios about ourselves and then we'll get started. So my name is Emily Fishburn. I am the Senior Prevention Specialist in the Office of Equity at Utah State University. Uh, so my role is to coordinate discrimination and sexual misconduct prevention efforts for all of Utah State's 32 campuses throughout the state. Uh, so we are a land grant institution. And so both Shelly and I are located at the main campus in Logan, Utah, uh, but we do have campuses through out to the state of Utah. Uh, I have a Master of Public Health degree and I am a Certified Health Education Specialist uh, and all of my professional career has been spent doing work related to sexual and reproductive health. So I'll turn it over to Shelly to introduce herself. And I'm Shelly Ortiz. I have been here at Utah State University for the past 15 years in the Office of Global Engagement. I am currently our Director of International Student and Scholar Services. Um, actually, my forage into international education began when I was 15 years old. I lived as an exchange student down with a family in Mexico, and it had a deep impact on the rest of my life. And so as such, I really enjoy supporting our visiting scholars and our international students who are here having their own life changing experience. Additionally, I have served as a trainer for the National Association of International Educators. Awesome. All right. So as Carrie indicated, she'll be monitoring the chat, but we'll also be taking a peek at it as we go along as well. So please feel free to put any questions or comments in there. There will be opportunities for y'all to engage with us and with each other as we go along. Um, we are the kind of presenters who don't like to lecture at people. We like to talk with people. Uh, and so hopefully you will find that as part of your experience today in the webinar. So we have been asked to speak to y'all about the strategies that Utah State uses for teaching international scholars about sexual misconduct topics. Uh, and so that is going to be the focus of our conversation with y'all this morning. Okay, so we'll go ahead and get ourselves going. So today's conversation is going to be divided into a few different parts. Uh, in the first part, we're going to talk about the wide variety of ways that both USU, but also all of you, um, could approach education for international populations at your respective institutions. And then the rest of our time is going to focus on specifically how we have decided to educate visiting scholars uh, at our institution related to sexual misconduct topics. And so we'll talk a little bit about where this program came from from, what it looks like, how we do it, uh, and then we will have a conversation with y'all at the end about potential next steps for yourselves. So what would it look like to implement similar kinds of programming at your institution uh, or maybe implementing some of those various education strategies that we're going to introduce uh, shortly. Okay, so the reality is, is that there's a lot of different ways to educate international populations about sexual misconduct topics. And I think what's first and foremost important for all of us to recognize is that our international populations, just like our domestic students, benefit from having education about sexual misconduct topics, right? And not just things related to these are the policies, these are the kinds of behaviors we don't want you to be engaging in, but also education related to the things that we do want our populations to be doing. You know, things like healthy relationships or consent or boundary setting, seeking resources if they're struggling, right? And so I think it's important for all of us um, to recognize that the why behind educating international populations is really the same why uh, behind why we also educate domestic populations. But I also think that there's an additional why um, in the sense that international populations may not be familiar with United States norms or culture related to things like relationships and dating and, and behaviors that we should or shouldn't be saying or things that we should or shouldn't be doing. Uh, and so there's that additional why of also helping our international populations be successful uh, at navigating their time uh, within the United States. So some institutions choose to do this kind of education as part of their orientation program. Uh, and that's not quite something that Utah State has decided to do at this point, although it's certainly something that Shelly and I uh, have discussed and other folks uh, within her uh, office have discussed as well. Something that Utah State has done in the past pre-COVID land, um, is we had students take an optional online course. Um, the one provided through Student Success or Vector Solutions is called Title IX Essentials for International Students. Uh, we got some really good feedback from our international populations related to that course. They really appreciated the way that it approached educating about 
United States customs and norms uh, and just gave them what they felt like was a really good introduction to kind of the setting surrounding federal Title IX law, uh, but also sexual misconduct issues in the United States in general. So that might be something we're thinking about for y'all is having some sort of online course or module uh, that you provide to your international populations, especially if maybe you don't have capacity to provide an ongoing live training, such as the one that Shelly and I are going to be focusing on in the rest of our presentation today. Some institutions also choose to do messaging campaigns that are targeted towards international populations. Again, that might be something for y'all to, to be thinking about at your institutions is what does it look like to make sure that international students are incorporated into your messaging campaigns and or that you're developing campaigns in conjunction with them that really speak to them about sexual misconduct topics. Something that Utah State has explored, and again, COVID just really stopped this process, was thinking about how we can translate some of our materials, especially related to uh, the Title IX processes, whether that's you know, the investigation processes through the Office of Equity at our institution or the therapy and advocacy support that's uh, available through our Sexual Assault and Anti-Violence Information Office, is just thinking about what are the various ways that we can make sure that we're communicating to international populations in their primary or their first language. And something that we know about Title IX and its processes is that they're very confusing, even for domestic students who maybe English is their first or their primary language. And so there's that additional barrier then for international populations in terms of navigating the process or understanding the process. We also know that international populations often have concerns related to immigration and visa statuses when they have experiences of sexual misconduct. Uh, and so the State University System of New York or SUNY has actually developed a pretty great immigration and visa guide that you can download from their, their materials. And it has the ability to be translated into, I think like 120 languages. So that's something that um, we have explored in the past that hopefully we'll be able to pick back up uh, once things with COVID COVID life have settled down a little bit more. Some of you might also have messaging around your institutions related to things like 10 things to know about Title IX, and you might want to think about translating those materials into additional languages as well. And then the last way to educate is really thinking about having actual guided conversations. And so that's the focus of our conversation with y'all this morning in this webinar is what does it look like to facilitate this kind of conversation about these topics with international populations? And so depending on the structure of your respective institutions, this might look like going into international student club meetings and having these conversations, or maybe it's having a set presentation that international populations Populations are expected to participate in, which is the way that Utah State has decided to approach this for our visiting scholar group. Um, so with all of that being said, I think the big thing to keep in mind is that it is possible for me to educate international populations about these topics. And Shelley and I would argue that it's necessary to educate them. We want them to be successful at navigating this aspect of their life of being a member of a university community. Um, and we can't expect them to be able to do that on their own, just like we can't expect domestic students to be able to do that on their own. And so that's really um, what drove the impetus for creating the program that we have at Utah State that we've been asked to present to y'all today. So let's talk a little bit about where this came from. And when we use the term visiting scholars, let me explain that at Utah State University, visiting scholars, we usually have about 125-ish per year right now, obviously due to COVID and visa appointments and other things we can't control, our population is a lot less. But in our case, I would say about 90% of our visiting scholars are not employees and they're not students. So they're kind of in this little gray area where they're their own little island that they're not fully integrated into the university, either as employees or as students. And so what we do when we work with them is that we just help them to support as they're doing some program objectives, some collaborative research. And we had in 2016, a couple of experiences that were unique. And at the time they were reported to our Title IX officer and the Title IX officer and their office went through the process. And at the very end, someone said, hmm, maybe we should reach out to Shelley and talk to Shelley and talk about what it has to do as far as, because they're international um, visiting scholars at that point. And so they reached out to me and one of the cases was really fascinating to me and the fact that um, 
the faculty host for the visiting scholar had submitted a harassment complaint. And what had happened is this individual had been offering gifts and the faculty host would be like, no, no, no. And then they'd say, no, no, then you need to come to my home and I need to make you dinner. And the more the faculty host said, no, no, the more the visiting scholar would come up with other things. They'd offer them money, you know, something. And so when I became involved, I realized that this visiting scholar came from a culture where they feel obligated to show honor to their faculty host. And so they were trying to do what culturally was acceptable for them to show honor, offering gifts, hosting them in their home, offering the money. And the more that the faculty host said no, the more the cultural paradigm of that visiting scholar said, oh no, let me try this. And they would try and do more and more. And they were interpreting as the faculty host saying, that's not the way I want to be honored. And so they're trying to figure out how the faculty host wants to be honored while the faculty host is feeling harassed. And so we had this really disconnect going on. And it made me realize that we are required to provide a orientation as mandated by the U.S. Department of State. And in it, there's certain elements that we're supposed to talk about, but somehow we're not really capacitating these visiting scholars to interact culturally and deal with difficult situations on our campus. And so I was having this thought, and then Emily's position was created. And Emily shows up in one of our staff meetings to introduce herself and talk about it. And she says, and if there's any way I can help you support your work, let me know. And I'm like, Definitely, let's talk. And so this is where every the origin of our program. So in coming up with our program, we came up with some goals. First of all, we want to help them understand some of the various terms used in the USA related to sex and sexuality. And what's and Emily already alluded to this previously a little bit is that I mean you have English as a second language. So there's that as well as you're teaching the concept behind it. So we have multiple layers when we talk terms that we're just trying to help them understand both concept and what does this word mean in English. Then we, after that, we also wanted to um, understand more terms used as far as it relates directly to USU sexual misconduct policy. Then we all wanted to understand where to get help as they are facing maybe situations here on campus. And finally, we wanted them to reflect on their own experiences, particularly to say, where am I? Where am I coming from? What are my natural expectations? And then kind of shift it and think, okay, what is this community expecting and, and how is that different? And so those were the goals that we had. So we sat down and we talked about the program and the logistics that we wanted to come up with and what we wanted to achieve through this. Um, so, in doing so, the first was the content development. And when we hit content development, I just looked at Emily and I said, that is yours. And in fact, I just read through an article in Social Justice in Higher Education, and it was talking about how if we put everything onto the Office of International Student and Scholars and expect them to address all concerns related to international student and scholars, we're actually marginalizing that population. And what we need to do is integrate them into our current services. So I really appreciate that Emily has stepped in as a key partner and worked very closely with us rather than just kind of giving me the content and expecting me to do the presentation. So that has been great in that regard. Then we talked about the program uh, coordination. How are we gonna present that? What could we do? We talked about um, doing some role play, some examples, as well as these guided group discussions, ways to really make it effective. And then we did some advertising. And you can see here an image of one of the email newsletter type things that we sent out. And I will say that that was not the most effective advertising way. And I found that personal touch, especially if I send something that comes from my email and say, this is mandatory, I, I look forward to meeting you there, then we get a lot better turnout. And I thought at one point it was because, you know, they're coming from cultures where they're relationship based and, and they're relying on that relationship form of communication, which I think that is a factor, but I also think, one more layer make play into that is that you are coming and you're talking about this awkward topic in a culture that you're not 100% comfortable in. But if there's someone there inviting you saying, I look forward to meeting there, I'll be there to support you. I think that would also has been effective based on some of the comments and feedback that I've received.
All right, so we have done this program three times so far. Uh, so we did it twice pre-COVID. Um, and so both of those sessions were in person. And so we had the opportunity to interact with the, the visiting scholars live in person. And Shelly was very gracious to provide snacks for everybody at those settings as well. So that was helpful. Uh, and then you know, during COVID, so last fall, we did it entirely via Zoom, and that was a different experience than, than doing it in person. We definitely found that the visiting scholars were, I wouldn't say less engaged, but maybe a little bit more shy in terms of actually contributing to the dialogue and, and participating in that conversation since it was happening virtually. And then this fall, we're actually doing this program tomorrow, uh, so this webinar has great timing. Uh, we're going to do a hybrid format, so we're going to have people uh, come in person, uh, but also have people have the ability to to log in via Zoom as well. And so that'll be the first time that we're doing it in a hybrid format. Uh, but our university has been providing sexual misconduct prevention trainings in a hybrid format uh, this entire fall semester. Uh, so my team is pretty confident in our ability to navigate uh, that part of the process. Um, but I think it'll be interesting to see if that's something that Shelly and I decide to continue or if we would like to go back to the fully in-person model um, once it is completely safe for us to do so, hopefully post-COVID next year. Okay, so I am going to spend some time reviewing some of the various aspects of the presentation content. So the content that um, I created and then Shelly and I workshopped and determined this would make sense. We need some more plain language here, those kinds of things. We want to give you all an example essentially of, of what it looks like uh, in this live facilitated presentation. Now, I will note that Shelly and I co-facilitate this presentation. So again, that really collaborative nature of the program is is what I think has allowed it to be so successful, right? The visiting scholars know Shelly as their point of contact, so they have her in the room and have her in the space, and she's the one that's demonstrating to them that it is okay to talk about these kinds of things. It is okay to have questions or concerns about these kinds of things. And then we have me and my team in the space to really be able to provide more of that content expert kind of lens, uh, and to also help the visiting scholars develop vocabulary and language that maybe they're not used to using or weren't aware that is used in the United States related to these topics. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about the various kinds of program content that we have. So as Shelly uh, demonstrated when she was reviewing the goals, we have four big parts of the presentation that we go through. So part one is all about the terms, right? We wanna make sure that the visiting scholars understand the various kinds of vocabulary that we're going to be using with them as part of the presentation. So we define things like sexuality for them. So helping them understand that the United States has a lot of different terms that we use within the realm of sexual misconduct. So we mean something different when we talk about someone's sex versus someone's gender. We also mean something different when we talk about sexual orientation. And so we like to use a lot of different imagery for them. We've used the gender bred person in the past. I've also educated with the, the gender unicorn, right? There's a lot of different ways that we can represent how these terms connect. But that is something that we have found has been so instrumental for the visiting scholars is the ability to have something to take with them afterwards. So what we definitely have noticed is they've taken a lot of screenshots of this particular image when it comes up on the slide because it really helps them understand how all of the terms connect. And then it also gives them a place to go to learn more about the terms or to understand more about how they are used um, within the United States. So we really have tried to make sure that the slides are not super text heavy, that a lot of the material is being presented either in imagery or verbally so that there's the opportunity for people to learn in a lot of different ways. Um, but we also want to be sensitive to the fact that you know, our visiting scholars are in some respects maybe translating what we are saying in English into their, their primary language and then also you know, thinking about it in lots of different ways. So we're trying to, to be sensitive to the various ways that our visiting scholars are engaging with the material as well as learning as we go along. So we also spend some time talking to the visiting scholars about who can be in a dating relationship with people in the United States, right? So recognizing that some of them might be coming from cultures where same sex or same gender relationships might be frowned upon within society, right? Or might be looked upon in a very negative light. And so we also try to prep them in terms of 
you will see individuals on our campus where maybe you don't know what their gender is, or you might see same sex or same gender couples holding hands or kissing or cuddling on our campus. And so we want to let you know that that's okay in the United States. That's something that you know happens here. Um, so again, really trying to help them acclimate to not only just the university culture in general, but also United States culture related to sexuality. Um, and dating is such an important part of the opening process related to this presentation. We also think it's really important for visiting scholars to be aware of the fact that the United States believes that people have bodily autonomy rights. Um, and so we also believe that as an institution, and, and this is a central part of all of the programming that my team does related to sexual misconduct prevention, is making sure that members of our university community understand that they have a right to their body and a right to dictate how people interact with their body. They have a right to feel safe uh, in their environments and safe in their body. They also have the right to be free from coercion and manipulation by others, whether that's a friend or a family member or even a boss. We also make it clear that people have the right to clear and concise communication from people and that they have the right to provide enthusiastic consent, not just for sexual activity, but for anything, right? So if someone, for instance, doesn't want pineapple on their pizza, they have the right to say that, right? Uh, and so we think it's really important for the visiting scholars to also understand that, again, the United States cares a lot about rights. Right? That's a, that is a big thing that we emphasize for the, the visiting scholars in, in this presentation. And we think it's particularly important for them to be aware of the fact that those rights not only extend um, you know, to things that are specific in the Constitution of the United States or in laws and policies in the United States, um, but they also extend to how we think human beings should be treated uh, and, and making that connection for the visiting scholars is really important to us because we want them to be able to understand that a big reason why our university and cares about sexual misconduct issues and why Title IX is a law in the United States is because sexual misconduct behaviors violate people's boundaries and their bodily autonomy rights. And so we want to make it very clear to the visiting scholars that if you have any of these experiences, these things are being violated and that's not okay. And you have the right to tell someone or to seek help related to those experiences. So from there, then we move into talking about what does it look like to actually give consent? How does Utah State define consent? Um, and then how do we also define the various kinds of behaviors that are not okay at our university? And so Shelly mentioned earlier that part of our presentation is role play, and it's very true. So we've set up scenarios for these definitions to help the visiting scholars understand them better. And we'll do role plays that demonstrate these various kinds of behaviors. And so those have been, I think, a really instrumental part of helping the visiting scholars visualize or understand specifically what does it look like for someone to be discriminated against based on their sex, right? Or what does sexual harassment actually look like? Uh, and so for the ones where it wouldn't be appropriate for us to demonstrate them, uh, we have specific scenarios that help the visiting scholars try to understand the various components of that scenario and why that scenario qualifies as sexual assault, for instance. So this is a part of the presentation that is really interactive with the visiting scholars. Again, we want to make sure that they have a concrete understanding of these various kinds of behaviors. Again, not only so that they don't engage in them themselves, but also so that if they notice them going on around them, or if someone is directing these behaviors at them, they know that they're not okay, and they know that something can and should be done um, about those behaviors. <clears throat> We also, in the presentation, um, borrowed a video. Oh, I don't remember where it's from, but we borrowed a video of international students talking about why conversations about these topics really matters. And so that is something that we have also inserted into the presentation as an opportunity for visiting scholars to see people such as themselves talking about why they think it's important to participate in a program like this as well. So like Shelly mentioned, you know, these conversations can be really squishy for a lot of people, right? They can make people feel uncomfortable. And so when we found that video, we were like, oh, yes, this is great. This is a great opener behind Shelly's introduction of the program to really set the stage for why we think it's so important for visiting scholars to be having these kinds of conversations. And then lastly, 
We talk about how they can be supportive of people in their lives who have these experiences. So, you know, doing things like starting by believing. So Utah State is a start by believing institution. Um, we're part of that national movement. And so that is something that we educate individuals about in terms of if someone comes forward and tells you that they've had an experience in this realm, we really do encourage you to start by believing what they say about their experience and then transition into being an active listener, asking open-ended questions, supporting that person and making their own decisions, and then being willing to refer them to places that can help and being aware of the specific places that can help. So again, we also want to empower the visiting scholars to feel like they know what to do if someone was to come to them and say, hey, I'm having this experience. I'm not sure what to do. I don't know how to get it to stop or or those kinds of things. We want them again to feel supported in not only being able to help that person who's talking to them, but also empower that person to get connected to resources as well. Okay. So that's the presentation content. And usually we do smush that into about 30 minutes. So it's you know rapid fire, but also pretty, pretty relatively paced. And then the last part of the, the presentation is related to discussion questions. And we do roughly about 30 minutes for this. Uh, and so what we've done in the past is we've had some colleagues from Global Engagement and some colleagues from my team come and we break the visiting scholars out into individual small groups. And then we talk about the various kinds of discussion questions with them. Uh, one year we assigned each group a discussion question because we had enough participation to be able to assign each group a single question. Um, and then the other year that we were in person, we just had every group discuss every question because it was a smaller uh, sized population. So the guided discussion questions, I believe there are six of them. Four of them? I don't remember. We'll find out, y'all. Um, so we have them talk about things like what they've noticed about how people interact in the United States and whether that's the same or different as in their home country. Again, this is really the part of the presentation, like Shelly mentioned, where we wanted the scholars to be able to reflect, to think about the connection between what we talked about in kind of the lecture portion of the program to their own personal lives. We also have them talk a little bit about what they've noticed about dating relationships and again, how they are the same and different as, as what they've experienced in their home country. We also have groups talk about what they learned, right? So what are the things that they learned about those terms as part of participating in the program? And how, again, does that look similar or different to their home country? You know, something that was really fascinating to me as someone who doesn't work with international populations very often is I, the first year we did this, was assigned to this question, so the group that talked about this one. And I had a number of scholars who told me that, you know, in their home countries, things like sexual harassment and dating and domestic violence are just permitted. That's pretty normal culturally for them. Uh, and so that was a really good learning moment for me that first year to be able to understand that, you know, here in the United States and especially at Utah State, we have pretty expansive definitions at colleges and universities about these terms. And sometimes we might take for granted the reality that that's not true everywhere else in the world in, in terms of, of how these behaviors are defined. And um, so I think that that was also a really great learning moment for those visiting scholars to really be able to reflect and say, Wow, some of these things that maybe I've been taught that are okay are not actually okay. <laughs> maybe shouldn't be happening or shouldn't be taking place, right? And so I think that was also helpful for them. And then the last question, so there were four, not six, uh, is asking them to talk a little bit about what was still confusing to them about the content, right? So kind of that last opportunity for us to come together when we debriefed all of these questions to make sure that Shelly or I could address any lingering questions that they had about was what was being covered in the program. And then this also served as kind of a, a de facto assessment for us, right? Did we actually clearly communicate about these terms? Did we cover everything we needed to cover? Uh, and what else uh, did the scholars want to learn was also something that we addressed with them as well. Okay. And then lastly, we would move into a summary. So you know, we thought it was important in our last closing minutes to make sure that the visiting scholars were reminded of, of where we had been. Right? So you're reminding them that 
at our institution, we expect all members of our university community to treat each other with respect and dignity. And we also encourage people to recognize when things are going on that shouldn't be going on and to try to do something about them. So we briefly introduced the concept of, of being a, a bystander who intervenes um, in this particular moment. And then lastly, we remind them that they do have the ability to get help if they experience sexual misconduct or if someone that they know experiences it. At Utah State, we have created sexual misconduct resource guides, and there's a screen grab of an old version of them up on the screen. So there are these little blue pocket-sized books, uh, and they summarize all of the various resources and reporting options for uh, members of our university community. So visiting scholars do have the ability to access some of those resources, and so we think it's important for them to be aware that those resources exist, uh, and when we were doing this in person, we would physically hand each them a copy of the resource guide so that they had it as well. Okay, so that is the program in a nutshell. Uh, I would wager for many of you that are viewing the webinar that a lot of this content probably already exists amongst your respective education teams in some way, shape, or form. I know it certainly did for us. And so for when my team put this presentation together, a lot of it ended up being consulting with Shelly and her colleagues about effective ways to then communicate the content. So that's what we really focused on when we were doing that program development portion. Shelly, is there anything else that you want to add on about the program content before we talk a little bit about assessment? <clears throat> I think my takeaway was that I learned a lot through the whole presentation. And so what we actually have done since then, as I said, that we we want to help these these visiting scholars adjust. And so we've actually added a component based on the content that I learned through this into our orientation. And so it's almost a precursor to this. I have a chance to have some one on one conversations kind of introduce these topics and some general expectations. And that asked actually, because we do these orientations on a one on one setting that's led to some open conversations that even sometimes I still struggle with. Like I had someone from Latin America arrive in last month and He's like, so you mean I can't hug anyone and I can't kiss anyone. And I'm like, um, well, maybe, you know, and, and I just have to kind of work through it myself. I think what I take away is like, ask permission. I, I would say, always ask him, say, can I give you a kiss? Can I give you a hug? Um, can I kiss you on the cheek? So that's what we've come away. And it's been some great conversations that have made their experiences seem more rich because they're more aware of what's happening as they begin their program. All right, so the last time that we assessed the program was the last time that we were in person. So uh, we assessed it in spring of 2019. And that year there were 68 scholars uh, that were visiting Utah State and we had 43 of them attend. So it was a pretty good uh, attendance rate for us um, that year. Uh, and so we did some within program assessment, like I mentioned, right? So checking for clarification and checking for questions, checking for understanding. Um, as well as, again, you know, I'm a firm believer that you can also assess the efficacy of a program based on the responses that people give to discussion questions, right? And so that is also something that ended up being part of our within program assessment. We also did conduct a very brief Qualtrics survey. So Qualtrics is the, the system, the surveying system that Utah State uses. And we emailed that out to participants about a week after the program. So we didn't have a ton of people participate in that survey, which was okay, um, but it still gave us a sense of, of how people were feeling about the program. And in general, they felt pretty good about it. They felt like they had a better understanding of some of the terms that we talked about, and they felt like they had a better understanding of support resources as well. So um, given the hybrid nature this year, we'll definitely repeat the, the assessment with the scholars who end up attending this year. Um, and just to try to understand if some of the small improvements that we've made to the program since we originally implemented it in 2019, uh, have helped uh, improve the quality of the program. So that brings us then to talking a little bit about some lessons learned uh, and I'll let Shelly start and then I can contribute anything else in terms of lessons that I and my team have learned as well. So the first one is, is time. And we should have known this from the beginning that time is a different concept to different people. And we were 
had it all set up that we're going to start at this time, we're going to end at this time, we're going to do it. And we realized that you need more time as much because of cultural difference perceptions of time, as well as we had some technology struggles. You wanted to check people in. Um, people wanted to say hello and have a little bit of a chat. So time was definitely the biggest one that we learned about. Um, Emily does mention the within program assessment. I just want to emphasize the dynamic nature of the program assessment. So we actually did a role play and after we did the role play, we're thinking, ah, well done. And then we, someone happened to hear another visiting scholar in the audience say, turn to someone and say, okay, so what's wrong with that? And then we had this one of these aha moments that we shouldn't just assume that because we played it out that they were going to interpret it the way we intended them to interpret. So a lot of dynamic nature, you're thinking on your feet. And so we've learned to plant people in the audience. And like we talked about, my team members, um, Emily's team members to be there for that instant feedback and, and adjustment of some of the concepts and work that we're doing. In terms of lessons learned from me, I think the biggest thing for me was continued practice in plain language explanations, which is really important within the realm of Title IX and sexual misconduct because we use so much jargon in this field. Uh, and so it was a really great exercise for me in terms of thinking about, okay, how do I explain a concept like sexual orientation to someone who's maybe never heard that term before or in their culture uh, or country of origin, it's described differently, right? Or it's not even mentioned as an identity factor that people have. And so for me, that was a big thing that I learned. And so those were some of the changes that we've made to the slide deck over the years is continuing to cut down on the jargon, cut down on the lingo and put as much plain language in there as we possibly can. Um, so that's been a big change, I think, from the education construction side of things um, that we have done well that I think is, is really important. All right. So I believe that brings us to the end of our prepared content. So now is the opportunity for a little bit of discussion for those of you who are, are interested in, in doing this with us. And um, so given the fact that we're being recorded, we're not gonna send you all into breakout rooms, um, but we will have you stay with us and you're welcome to unmute and answer these questions verbally, but we also encourage you to be willing to put some thoughts in the chat as well. So a central theme to this program is collaboration. And hopefully that's something that y'all have taken away uh, from mine and Shelley's comments uh, this morning is just that if we are willing to collaborate, we can do bigger and better things, right? So that's our first question really is, you know, what experiences have you had on your campus where you wished you had partnerships with other offices, departments, or staff members? Nice. So again, you're welcome to put some thoughts in the chat or you're welcome to share some things verbally if you're willing to. What are some of those experiences where something happened and you wish you would have had a partnership with an office that maybe could help you, but you didn't? And yes, Marilyn, to answer your question in the chat, I'll look for the video link before we close out today so that y'all can see that as well. Yes, you're welcome. All right. Any thoughts related to experiences that you've had that you're willing to share? Marilyn, that's awesome. I'm glad that y'all have great partnerships at your institution, and I'm sure that allows y'all to be really effective at, at doing a lot of work within the, the realm of sexual misconduct. It's awesome. Just to note, I know some of you are aware, but there is, you do have the ability to unmute yourself in, on the side um, there where you just click on the microphone. So if you've never done it before, it's pretty simple. So you can contribute as you are comfortable to the conversation. The chat room is also great. Thanks, Carrie, for that reminder. Carrie, can I put you on the spot to talk about when you used to work at an institution? Were there ever any times where you wished you had partnerships for certain things, but you didn't? Oh, certainly. Um, I always found building those here. Let me start my video too. It's kind of weird to have somebody talk. Um, yeah, I mean, without question. And I think that the important thing is too, is not to be 
afraid to reach out um, and try and build that relationship and understanding that, I mean, my experience too was a lot of time people were like, hey, we get it, but I don't know where we're going to fit this in or how we're going to um, get this process started. So I think one, not being afraid to reach out and hearing not now is not a no period, but you kind of sometimes have to continue to kind of slowly um, build that relationship and work with that person. And sometimes that means stepping outside of just even the main thing you want to focus on, but broadening that scope to build trust and build relationships with someone. So yeah, yes, with that question, I used, um, for those that are on the call, don't know, I used to be an assistant dean and director of residence life. So there was a lot of um, opportunities to build relationships and um, improve upon the work that we were doing for the students there. Thanks, Carrie, for being willing to put on the spot. And I agree with you. I think that you know, being willing to understand that timing is everything in higher ed is a really important part of, of doing this kind of work, too. So um, to Nicola's point in the chat, right, often what we find ourselves having are good partnerships or at least existing partnerships, but they're often called upon to be reactive, right? So less proactive. And so I think that that is what is so beautiful about this program for the visiting scholars at our institution is that it is designed to be proactive, right? It is truly designed to be a primary prevention approach for these visiting scholars in terms of not having experiences of sexual misconduct, or again, not perpetrating these behaviors themselves. And so one challenge that I, I think we would like to impart on all of you is to really think about how can you go about building partnerships that you might still need and what does it look like to nurture them and to maintain them over time because the reality is is that we might know someone maybe in the equivalent of your office of global engagement you might be aware of them um, but maybe you've never had the opportunity to have a conversation or you've never made the opportunity to have a conversation with them about a program like this right so it is that willingness to to create that space to be proactive which i think is so essential to a partnership like this one and then, you know, the other question for you all to consider, and I imagine that this is a, a mixed bag for those of you who are tuning into the webinar, is some of you maybe have created partnerships that provide this kind of training, and some of you might not have. And so what Shelly and I would definitely encourage you to do is to figure out who could you partnership, who would you need to partner with in order to make this happen, and what does it look like for you to try to maybe get a meeting scheduled with them to explore the possibility of a program like this. I have to say that the first year that Shelly and I did this, I don't know, Shelly, it was maybe like five hours, 10 hours of prep time. It really like ultimately did not end up being a ton of investment of time to make it happen. And so for us, it ended up being more of a prioritization to make that make it happen, right? And so I think that is the, the key piece is thinking about if this is an avenue that you all want to explore at your respective institutions, what would it take for it to, to be a priority or to at least be something that you want to specifically explore? And then and I to add to that though, Emily, is because we're talking about proactive, but the reality was this was actually reactive on my part because I had had an experience mm -hmm. and I had seen the value of it. And so you're right, if you approach it, it, it's hard to get people engaged unless they have a reason that becomes mutually beneficial to them. And mm -hmm. so what language, what can you use to make them feel that it's mutually beneficial instead of you're just adding one more thing that mm -hmm. they need to be teaching someone else? Yes. Yeah. And thanks, Shelly. I appreciate you adding that because it is, I mean, it's true that a lot of times, especially in higher ed, we do need to find ways for things to be mutually beneficial for folks, right? And so when we are willing to use that language of, of being mutually beneficial or again, a collaboration that multiple units or multiple people are going to get something positive out of, we have the ability then to, to create this kind of programming or at least more likely to set the stage for this kind of programming to take place. So the other thing that Shelly and I encourage y'all to think about is that for those of you who do have established partnerships to provide this kind of training, how is that partnership going? Does it need a tune-up? <laughs> Does it need to be checked in on, right? How can you make sure that that relationship is, is maintained? Um, you know, Shelly and I are in maintenance mode at this point, right? So we check in, you know, at the start of the semester and say, when do we want this to take place? Here's the old content that we used. What kind of edits do we need to make to it? Uh, and so we have, you know, gone through the process of, of being able to be in that maintenance mode. Um, but that doesn't mean that we don't communicate at other times throughout the year either when there are additional needs that might arise in terms of supporting the visiting scholars group as well. Okay. 
And then for those of you who don't, oh, go ahead, Shelly. Well, I'm just going to say, I'm going to go ahead and I'm responding to Marilyn put into the chat that she thought the goals of this could be achieved in a single session for all students. And I'm going to say on a surface level, yes, you could, but the reality is, is what we're seeing and is you're talking about the cultural differences, which I've tried to emphasize throughout this. And so you need to take more time to break it down for those international populations who have a different paradigm and even you have multiple different paradigms that one of the values in the group discussion that we had with these visiting scholars is that they were even learning from each other and I was learning as I was listening to them because I had someone from Asia I had someone from Europe and I had someone from somewhere in Africa and I'm hearing these wide varieties of things and realizing that we had to maybe be a little bit more inclusive and in thinking of how we're going to address these topics. So I would actually, if I were you doing something like this, um, a lot of international offices are trying to think of programming to help their students overcome these cultural, you know, cycles and, and adaptation to the new culture. And how could you become a part of something like that? That would be my recommendation and for specifically for international students. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Shelley. And I agree. I think that that is also a, you know, a good response to the last question that we're going to pose for you all to think about as you leave this webinar is if you need to create a partnership or maybe you need to create a stronger partnership or a different partnership, how can you again demonstrate the, the value and the benefit of, of having a program that is more specific to international populations? And I agree with Shelley that it, it really does allow you to be more uh, attuned and tailored to the work um, as well as to the population needs specifically. So for those of you who work at institutions where you know, a sexual misconduct presentation is being slotted into orientation for all students, it might be worth exploring with your orientation folks, right? That might be an additional partnership that you need to make in terms of figuring out how can we also make sure that international populations have the ability to learn general information about United States culture before they do this presentation or maybe after they do this presentation, right? Because we think it's really important um, for them to also have more of that cultural understanding uh, before they participate in the program that quite frankly is going to be more directed at domestic students, right? A lot of the programming that colleges and universities do related to sexual misconduct prevention is being created by people who are domestically located in the United States, often are from the United States. And so therefore that is the lens that is being brought into the programming specifically. So we do think that it's important for international populations to receive some sort of separate dialogue about these topics in order to allow them to be most successful at navigating them as well. Okay, all right, y'all, so in terms of your potential next steps, right? So Shelly and I are firm believers in not just doing a webinar to do a webinar, but to really encourage people to do something with the webinar content. And so we think that it's important for you to consider and communicate about how this kind of program could be valuable to your institution, right? Who are those key people that you need to be communicating this to, right? And what does it look like to start the ball rolling? Maybe it's not a program that you can implement this academic year, totally fine. Maybe you start the process of implementing it next fall, right? And you get going now. A lot of us know that you have to start six months ahead in higher ed for things to happen, right? So that might be an essential part of your process is getting those conversations conversations going now so that you have the ability to work within what is a typical higher ed timeline. We also think it's important for you all to be considered of the kinds of programming and teaching methods that would actually work best. So, uh, you know, for those of you who are watching this, that maybe you're not a residential campus, maybe an in-person session is not what's most appropriate. Maybe it is some sort of pre-recorded webinar or thinking about using uh, a preset course from an online course vendor, right? So we also encourage you to do that needs assessment of your international populations to figure out what kind of program are they going to respond best to. We do the, the in-person live presentation option because we know that these visiting scholars often end up being pretty isolated at our institution, and we want to give them the chance to really come together to have these conversations with each other and also to be able to spend some time with Shelley and her colleagues in the Office of Global Engagement so that it's not just 
you had that orientation meeting with me, I'll never see you again, right? It's that ongoing interaction with Shelly and her team. And so that's why we made the decision to actually have this be a live facilitated presentation every year. And then lastly, because barriers are a real thing, we think it's important for you to have a strategy up front related to overcoming them, right? So maybe a barrier is buy-in, right? Or, or maybe a barrier is lack of capacity or lack of resources to implement something like this, right? And so how can we be creative? What might it look like for you to involve international populations as the facilitators of a kind of program like this, right? So that's certainly something to think about, right? There are going to be students and, you know, scholars within your international populations who are passionate about these kinds of topics. And maybe that's something that they're willing to do with you as well, right? So there's lots of different ways to overcome those barriers, but being willing to be aware of the fact that they exist is the really essential part of the process of, of being able to plan for them to implement something similar. Shelly, any other last next steps that you would recommend? Great, thank you. Okay, perfect. All right, everybody. So that brings us to the end of our prepared content, and we certainly want to leave space for any other questions that you all have. So again, you're welcome to use the chat box. You're welcome to unmute. Uh, I will leave our contact information up here, but I'll also put it in the chat box for you all to have as well. Please do not hesitate to email us or, or give us a call. We are absolutely happy to support you all in implementing a similar kind of program. Um, and once I put our contact details in the chat, I'm also going to go look for that video link so that you all have it as well. So I'll jump in and, and if others who are attending the presentation have questions, certainly would encourage you to do so. Um, but I did have a question for both Emily and Shelley um, with regards to, and I want to say I appreciated the point about making sure that you are intentional in how you reach your international scholars and students population um, and not just relying on the orientation type program because in the smaller groups are more likely to ask questions related to their misunderstanding or need to know more. Um, that they wouldn't likely ask in those larger settings um, and allows you to get in more of the culturally specific pieces. So I appreciate that comment. I wanted to ask uh, to what, um, how do you see, foresee, we know we have some campuses here in Ohio have some pretty strong peer education programs uh, about peer to peer facilitation of some of these same uh, questions or issues or um, topics. Um, is that something you foresee as a value add? And if so, what additional cultural competency or components do you feel are needed to help fully prep them in having those conversations from their standard residence hall type program or whatnot? So I can jump in to answer that one. I think that peer educators are incredibly valuable and we're fortunate at Utah State to have a, a group of peer educators that help us do the mandatory student sexual misconduct prevention trainings. Uh, and so we do have an international student who is one of those facilitators actually this year, which is really awesome. It's the first time we've had one. And it's been fantastic to have her uh, be part of the team in terms of providing a different perspective when she facilitates the content. I think in terms of prepping peer educators, the biggest piece of advice that I have is that you actually have to invest the time to prep them. I think it's really easy for us to say that like, oh, I'm going to give them the presentation slides, I'm going to give them presenter notes, and then off they go and they'll be able to implement it. But I think it's important for us to recognize that it's one thing to be able to be a learner in the audience about these topics and to be passionate about them. And it's a whole other thing to be in front of a group responsible for explaining them and having the ability to actually answer questions and, and navigate them effectively. And so I think in that particular setting, it's important to acknowledge that if y'all do decide to use peer educators, which I would fully support, I think that would be fantastic for international populations to hear from each other about people who are passionate about these kinds of topics as well, that you have that ability and that time investment to allow them to be successful. I would also say, too, that it's important to provide them space for those peer educators to also not understand things, right, to need support and assistance and, and those kinds of things as well. Shelly, is there anything that you would want to add related to using peers to provide a program like this? Well, I know you've had a conversation at one point uh, regarding international with the International Student Council. And what was their feedback when you approached them to be part of this? 
Yeah, that is correct, Shelley. I forgot about that. That was a while ago. So I think the International Student Council was particularly excited. I think for them, what they really needed was the expert content support, and they felt like they could mobilize the people to get there, but they didn't necessarily feel like they were able to provide the content themselves, or at least that particular council, there wasn't anyone that was super passionate on the council at the time that really wanted to, to co-facilitate it. But I think that that's a great point, Shelley, in bringing us back to you know, what we talked about in terms of other ways to educate is also thinking about who are your international populations that you could call upon to help you facilitate something like this? So is it an international student council? Is it a very specific like Asian, you know, student association, right? Like we've also kind of explored, we haven't implemented, but we've explored the possibility of collaborating with those kinds of groups specifically as well. Do any of our participants have any questions for either Emily or Shelley? I found the video link, so let me open the chat. Get it in there. Okay, there you go. So what we did to use the video is we just asked permission from International Student Insurance and they were like, yes, please use this. So then it's embedded in the presentation and, and we use it from there. I know you talked briefly about um, how you meet each year and change up the content a little bit on the presentation. Um, to what degree does that influence any, you know, how do you draft your scenarios and that sort of thing to keep not only keep them culturally relevant, but also to keep them uh, relevant to this day and age? I know we've received feedback from some campuses that some of them may be bystander intervention type <laughs> scenarios are like nobody would ever say that um, and, and student party. So, you know, so that happens no matter what. So how can you speak a little bit more to that? Well, I am going to say that this year we've had quite the staff turnover and I have a new staff and I'm actually excited because they're bringing some different perspectives based on areas they've lived in and around the world. So that was to be determined, but I, I, I think it's as much using our staff and their world experiences and, and their interpretations of some of cultural perceptions. I'm looking forward to bouncing ideas off of them and seeing what they change. I would agree with Shelley. I think part of it too is also, again, like using an international student council to <laughs> provide feedback about scenarios as well. So is this an actual experience that people have had? Is this something that seems reasonable? Those kinds of things are also things that you can assess you know, before you create the program, after you create the program, right? But yes, I think the key thing for all of us to keep in mind is that we do need to be constantly growing and evolving our programming as nice as it would be for us to create it in like 2019 and be like, yes, this will live off the shelf all the time, right? We unfortunately can't do that, right? We have to be responsive to changing needs and, and changing situations as we go. Well, and I'm going to add another very personal thing is that also the way I talk about this with our visiting scholars has shifted and it's as much because of the education component, but I've also had a personal experience with a family member. And so it's interesting how your own personal experiences start to, again, I talked about, you know, buy in, when is it mutually beneficial? When is it relevant? And so. That's just something to keep in the back of your mind as you're going through it. And then these other things, like you're talking about bystanding, we've talked about that, and that is an issue thing on our campus. But I think I do it more subconsciously when we're doing these changes. I don't know that we've necessarily been intentional, and maybe that's something that we can actually talk about, Emily. Any last uh any last call for questions, I guess, from the group or any last uh, closing thoughts from our presenters today? I think in terms of closing thoughts, as y'all are pondering, if there's any other questions that you have is 
just that sometimes the first step of doing a program like this can be the hardest part, right? So building that partnership or creating the content or <clears throat> getting through all of the logistics. And so I think it's in, it's always important to keep in mind that it's not just another task to do, right? It has the ability to really positively impact people. And I think that we have seen in the short period of time that we've been doing this, that visiting scholars feel more confident navigating United States norms and culture surrounding these issues because we have taken the time to invest in their ability to be successful at navigating those kinds of things. So I think that's my biggest piece of advice is whenever we think about tailoring a presentation for a specific audience, it's important for us to think about the positive outcomes, even if the logistics process or the time that has to be invested is, of course, time and logistics, right? But at the end of the day, you do have the ability to support people and being successful and to also demonstrate that you see them, right? that you understand that their experiences are not identical to everybody else's and that you want to make sure that they can also be successful given their identities, their backgrounds and their experiences as well. Shelly, any last minute things from you or? I feel like I've beat my drum and stood on my soapbox. So just thank you so much for the chance to share this and and share our, our imperfect experiences with you. Well, thank you both of you for being willing to share your imperfect experiences. I know uh, many of our participants, um, you know, have already said thank you and I've gotten seen a few requests already come through for the recording. So um, definitely this content is getting some wheels turning and some new thoughts. And so we so appreciate you being willing to share um, how you've done this work and your approach and um, with our, our campuses here at Ohio. So thank you so much for your time today. Um, we hope you have a great rest of your week. And thank you to those of you who did join us today. Uh, we appreciate you. Um, and if you'd like to request a copy of the uh, presentation, I put my email address in the chat and you can just send me an email and I will send you the recording when it is ready. So thank you so much to everyone today um, and enjoy the rest of your week. <laughs>